My name is Jim Hargrove. Uh, I'm a restaurant business consultant with Shamrock Foods. I've been doing that for about two years. The previous 35 years uh, was as in restaurant operations, just like all of you. Uh, like a bunch of you probably in this room, I ended up getting a job in high school in the restaurant business, and 35 years went by really fast, and I had a career. Uh, my last gig was in New Mexico, and a couple of partners, we had 12 restaurants and 10 different concepts. Why did we have 10 concepts? Because we were gluttons for punishment. It was more fun that way. Uh, but again, I've, I, I come from the same place you come from and for, for uh, three and a half decades. And now I'm privileged to be able to coach and teach and help folks that run restaurants, which means that I've got this big basket full of mistakes that I made. And I hand those mistakes to you so you don't make them. Um, so the last two years, I work in, in Colorado a little bit out of the state, but mostly here. So it's a, kind of a privilege to be able to see some friendly faces here in the room that I've worked with. Um, I go out to restaurants, I talk to owner operators, chefs, GMs, and the first thing we want to try to figure out is, where does it hurt, right? What's not working? And where's the pinch point? And I'm told 90, 95% of the time, staffing, 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 staffing. It is tough out there. It's the hardest I've ever seen it in my 37 years of being around the business of that people piece. We kind of got here, it's sort of a perfect storm. Uh, so I'm gonna preach to the choir for a minute here and tell you what you already know. When the economy in our country grows, we see more turnover in the hospitality industry. And our economy has been growing for 10 consecutive years, almost unheard of. So we've seen increases in turnover in our industry for 10 years. We'll talk about that more, a little bit more here in a second. Also, when that economy grows, other industries begin to expand and grow as well, and they start pulling people from us. The, the, the evolution of the gig economy is, is pulling people away from us. You can go drive for Uber or Lyft, you can work for TaskRabbit, any number of things that you can do in that gig economy and write your own schedule and either walk away from hospitality or, or work less for us. Um, in Colorado, there's the legalization of marijuana. The cannabis industry is pulling people away. They used to work in our kitchens and dining rooms and they are going in that direction. Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir and I'm telling you what you already know, but this is kind of how we got here. Um, and this is why it's as bad as it is. There's rumbles and rum rumblings and rumors of a slowdown on the economy. So we kind of go back and forth in the hospitality business. If it slows down, I get more people to work for me. If it slows down, fewer people come in and dine with me. So it's this tough balance, right? So it's, we want to try to solve for that today while we're talking for a little while. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of statistics and charts, but here's one chart I want to look at with you because I found it interesting. This is employment going back to 2002, actually 2000 in our country. That top line there, that's unemployed people, people looking for work. And you see that big spike in 2009 and 2010 during the recession. And the blue line below that is jobs open and available that need to be filled. You always want that blue line below that red line. So people are looking and looking and looking. Late 2018, they crossed. First time we've seen that in over 20 years in our country. There are now more jobs available than people to work them, right? Did you come here to get happy and motivated? <laughs> I know this is kind of sad right now and we're gonna, it's gonna get better. But this is just one more piece of the puzzle that, that you're up against. And I know you're up against and it's hard. There are restaurants out there that are thriving right now with the people piece. They've figured it out. And we're gonna talk about what they're doing and how they're doing it. These restaurants that have figured it out and really invest a lot in the people piece, they know exactly how many employees it takes to run their restaurant with precision. Front, back, bar, server, line cook, all that stuff. They track their employee turnover, which we're gonna look at here in a moment. Weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly. They know exactly what that number is. And they benchmark themselves against their past history and other restaurants. They budget for and know what it costs to replace a, a, an employee. And they've got that worked into their bottom line profit uh, workshop. So they have, you're gonna see this word a lot. You're gonna hear me say the word strategy a lot today, right? It used to be, 10, 12 years ago, the, the people piece, you could kind of just be a gunslinger. You just get the word out that you need cooks and guys show up, fill out an application and get them going. That doesn't happen anymore, right? You need, someone, you need a, a place filled, you might get one applicant 
in a week. There needs to be a strategy around our people piece, and we really need to have data and analytics more now than ever because of the fierce competition that we're up against. These folks are never done hiring, and they're always interviewing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I work with and talk to a lot of labor-stressed restaurants. They just can't seem to find good help, at least not like they used to. They're hopeful that good candidates will come in and apply. Not sure why people are leaving, and I ask restaurant operators if they lose somebody that's good to another restaurant or to another industry, did you do an exit interview and find out why they're leaving? No. Pissed at them. They're leaving. I don't want to talk to them anymore. People are leaving your restaurant, sit them down and ask them to talk to you for five minutes. How did we do? Was there something we could have done better? What would have made you stay? Find out what it is. Some of it's going to be pay. Some of it may be other things. So we need to find that out. And the definition of insanity, right, is doing the same thing over and over and over and hoping something's going to somehow change. That's being very hopeful. Hope is not a strategy, right? We can no longer just hope around our people piece. We have to strategize our people piece. So let's talk about that. Here's a few stats. Average turnover in a full-service restaurant in our country right now is 73% and rising, rising quickly. I put this slide together eight weeks ago. It's probably pushing 80 now. I see a lot of you guys taking pictures of the screens. Please feel free to do so. I can make this available to you, this deck, and we're also filming today. 132% at a counter-service restaurant. Eye-popping, right? Ouch. The most important number on that slide is 3,600 bucks. That's what it costs to replace an employee. And at least one person in the room has already figured that out. We talked earlier, sat down and figured it out. We have a tendency to look at the hard costs associated with replacing an employee, right? That's the wage you're paying them while they're training. That's one piece of the puzzle. There's other hard costs that could be meals you need to give them so they can taste stuff, maybe a little bit of wine so they can taste the wine. If you pay your trainers a little bit more, that's a hard cost. Soft costs go along with that too. Your time to recruit and hire. Um, the, the big piece, the soft piece that we don't ever really pay attention to is the four weeks after training because that's when they make their most mistakes. And those mistakes cost you money. So we come up with 3,600 bucks. That's a really important number to remember and talk about. We're going to talk about that a bunch. So, Two questions. How many employees does it take, with precision, how many t does it take on an average through the year to run your restaurant? And how many W-2s did you go through last year? Most of us don't know that. Those are two really important numbers to know. And the W-2 piece is easy. ADP or your accountant, whoever does that, find out who, what that is. And this is why. You're going to go back to your restaurants, you're going to start calculating turnover so you know where you stand and what you're spending. So you've got that ideal number of employees, right? You take your W-2s from last year, subtract that ideal staffing number, that's how many people left. Simple, right? Number of people left divided by ideal staffing number, that's your turnover percentage. So it looks like this. This is Joe's Bar and Grill, right? Joe's Bar and Grill needs 40 employees to run on an average through the year. Sent out 68 W-2s last year, 40 employees, 28 people left. Easy math, right? 28 employees who left divided by 40, that's 70% annual turnover for Joe's Bar and Grill. Here's where the rubber meets the road. 3,600 bucks times 28 employees that left, it's 100 Gs. If Joe's Bar and Grill's doing a million and a half bucks a year, that's 5% right off the top. You know what you're doing. It might, it might be more than one and a half. It might be two, it might be three, it might be four. Start multiplying that number. It becomes a really big number. Let's say that Joe's Bar and Grill adopts a strategy around the people piece and turnover control and goes from 28 to 14. You're still going to have turnover. It's never going to be completely solved. That's 50 grand back in Joe's Bar and Grill. We're all in the business and we're running restaurants and we're sweating payroll and we're trying to get our, we're trying to get Shamrock paid on time, hopefully, so I, I can get paid too. $50,000 at the end of the year in your pocket is massive for us. You've got three pieces of equipment in the kitchen that every other month you dump 600 bucks into to just kind of keep them running. Now you can replace them. 50,000 bucks maybe means you have one or two restaurants. Maybe that means a manager at your restaurant. And then you know what you could do? You ever heard of a weekend? 
you can take one of those off. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? And a year from now, that manager is trained, and you can take a, an equally strange word, a vacation. How would that be? Let's start strategizing this number, because this is where it counts. We look at food cost percentage of sales, we look at, uh, excuse me, labor cost, and we look at our food costs. We don't spend enough time looking at our turnover. Super, super important. So I told you when I go into restaurants in Colorado, people tell me, staffing, staffing, staffing. Is it a staffing problem or a turnover control problem? So the purpose is, I want you to switch your mindset. Staffing is the number one thing. It's number two. Nobody in here is running a restaurant that needs 40 employees and sends out 40 W-2s. It doesn't happen. Mathematically, you are staffing your restaurant. That's, that's the quote-unquote easy part. The hard part is the turnover control. And that's where you're going to save that money. So let's talk about it. First thing you got to do is know your audience. Those are the last six generations in our country. First two, the greatest in the silent generation, much, much older, beginning to pass away, quite frankly. The ones that matter to you folks as baby boomers, these were your whales. These are the folks that came in your restaurant for the last 10, 20 years at the height of their earning potential with good discretionary income. They're spending a lot of money in your restaurant. They are retiring at the rate of 10,000 a day. Baby boomers are retiring at the rate of 10,000 a day. They are important to your restaurants still, but they are beginning to exit your restaurant. They're going on to fixed income and they're retiring. It takes you to Gen X, that's my generation. We're at the peak of our earning potential. This is your new whale. This is who you need to make sure you're taking good care of. They're going to be spending money with you for a while. Then we get to the much maligned, unfairly maligned millennial generation. And we're not going to talk about why that's unfairly maligned, but I've studied the millennial generation a lot and you guys kind of got a raw deal. I'll talk to you about that later if you want to. <laughs> um, but I'm Gen X, and I, I feel bad for you. 20 years ago, tons of millennials were working in your restaurants and as hourly employees. They're now between 24 and 42 years of age. Did you know millennials were in their 40s? It happened. People, we have a tendency, there's a group of kids standing over there, about 18, and they're all on their phone, and they're all vaping. First, call 911, because they're vaping. That's not millennials. Those are Gen Z kids. They're 23 and younger. So for your purposes, between 16 and 23, that's a ton of hourly employees. That's your base. That's your pool. And you're going to have them for 10 more years as hourly employees in your restaurants. They are different than millennials. They're different than Gen X. It's important you understand who and what they are. So we're still at 93% of hourly employees under 34. Millennials are about half of that, exiting quickly, and here comes Gen Z coming in really, really fast. That is the Gen Z kid. It's a mess, right? We won't talk about all of those, but let's talk about some of these so you can begin to understand Gen Z, because I need you to manage to them, right? You need to know how to engage with this generation because the more you're engaged with them, the stickier you, stickier you are and the lower your turnover will become, okay? Biggest one, right in the middle, digital native, born with this in their face. This is the first generation to have never known a time when they didn't have, not a cell phone, but a smartphone. I'm 54, so I got my first smartphone, 40, 41, 42, when they first entered the market, right? Do you think that my experience in this world, the way that I engage with the world and meet the world head on, is different because I got a smartphone when I was 40 than a kid that got a smartphone when he was six? You better believe it. Those kids, and I have two Gen Z kids at home. Well, they're not at home, 23 and 22. Their brains are literally wired different than mine. And we didn't give them a ton of screen time, but those, their generation has had a ton of screen time. It's changed who they are. You need to understand that. Let's talk about a few more things here. Big one right here, safety. Safety, security, stability. Important to Gen Z, why? Because, there's another one up there, the Great Recession. When these kids were 12, 11, 10, 9 years old, the Great Recession happened. You were in your restaurants, you know how bad that sucked. That was awful, that was no fun at all. Gen Z were kids, so they saw their parents lose jobs, lose cars, lose houses, lose everything. 
If you were a Gen Z kid, not all of them, but if you were a Gen Z kid during the Great Recession, Christmas sucked for, for a few years. So change the way they think about money. This generation saves money at a higher percentage of any generation in our country. 16% of high school kids save money. Raise your hand if you, raised, if you saved money in high school. I, there was just a few. I couldn't wait to sp spend my money on member, those black things, albums, remember those? That's what I spent my money on. That's how old I am. Obviously, right above that is, is pretty tragic. The sense of safety is mass shootings. Gen Z has never known a time in their lives when they weren't watching the news with their parents or streaming news, when they didn't see their peers being slaughtered at school with automatic weapon fire. It changes who and what they are. You've got to manage to that, right? There are restaurants that have active shooter drills four times a year. Think about it. It makes your staff feel more stable and secure at your restaurant. Interestingly, up at the top on the right is engaged. Down there is isolated. This is the most engaged and isolated generation we've ever seen. Engaged, right? This was going to be the greatest thing ever to connect human beings. And it did connect us, not always in the best possible way. Social media is a little rough sometimes. When I was a kid, kids that got picked on in high school, at least at 3 o'clock, they could go home and shut the door, and it stopped. Gen Z, it never stops. You are picked on, never ending, right? So it's changed. It's made them isolated. The number two killer of Generation Z, I hate to say this, but it's true, is suicide. And psychologists are beginning to believe that it's this wonderful, horrible tool right here. So think, think about that as we're moving along. There's other stuff up there too, and we can talk about that later, but if I, if I tell you about all of those, which I know about all of those, we'll be here for hours. So let's keep moving. I've done nothing but bring the crowd down so far. I know that. <laughs> Talking about the economy and, uh, and Gen Z and all the stuff that we're up against. So I went out and scrubbed the internet because I want to make sure that you see the perfect prime example of Generation Z. It's a little bit tongue in cheek there. You'll see what I mean in just a minute. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Carl. So it seems like every other week, the kiddos of Generation Z seem to come out with new slang terms that quite frankly confuse the rest of us older generations. So the goal today is to learn how to speak some of that Gen Z lingo. And joining me today on how to translate some phrases is our favorite spokesperson for the Gen Z kids, my cousin Brock. Say hello, Brock. Brock, say hello. Stop. All right, let's get started. You guys have the Wi-Fi password? All right, Brock, we're gonna start with some simple ones. Yeah, okay. Hello, how are you? Saw, friends, fam, family, fam jam. It was a fun event, the fest was lit. Okay. Okay. I'm about to leave. I'm finna dip set. Those are some neat shoes. Them kicks are dripping. I would be glad to help, but my favorite team lost. Dudes took an L. My favorite team lost very bad. Dudes got clapped. He seems upset. He little mad. He seems very upset. He big mad. I like this music. That's a bop. I'm not lying. No cap. I'm sorry that happened to you. Oof. That's an interesting statement. Weird flex, but okay. I'm not a fan of these appetizers. These apps are booty. I completely agree with that statement. Facts. I agree. Yeet yeet. Excuse me. Yeet. Wow, that's exciting news. Yeet. Congratulations on your baby boy. Yeet. What does yeet even mean? Yeet is yeet. That doesn't help. It's like when fam comes slipping in with their dripping swag jamming to some sick bop. And no cap, you know these facts are about to be a litty fresh to death. You're like, oh, I'm not big mad at that booty response. Yeet. I don't get it. Weird flex, but okay. I, I don't know. I've shown this video a number of times. People from this generation will come up to me and tell me, nobody in my generation talks like that. People that look like me, a little bit of a belly, a little bit of gray hair, 
can I get that video? That's exactly how my kids talk and I don't know what the hell they're saying. <laughs> What's going on in your restaurant generationally? Anybody know anybody right now that's pregnant right now? So when they have their kid, you can go to the hospital and go, yeet. <laughs> yeah. Again, engage with your employees where they're coming from. I doubt if you have this employee, although a few people have told me, yeah, I have three of those working at my restaurant right now. They're great. Onboarding. We're not good at it. It's really important that we onboard well, especially now, and especially with Gen Z. They have had the world's knowledge at their fingertips since before they can remember. They like things to be strategized. They like to know what's going to happen and what's going on. And the more you do Gen Z, excuse me, onboarding correctly, the more you're going to be engaged with your employees. Most important one is on that one on the right, 82% reduction if you do onboarding correctly. And again, our industry is not good at it. Here's what we need to be doing, seven of them. Some of you are doing two. If you're really good, you're doing three, maybe three and a half. These, if, we, if we do these in a strategic way, you're going to lower your turnover. So let's spend a minute or two on each one, the attract and recruit part. Be mobile enabled. You've got a website, right? Who doesn't have a website? Everyone's got a website. Is it mobile enabled? Because Gen Z wants to work at your restaurant and they go to your website and it's not mobile enabled and it's too hard to navigate. Millennials, when they're concentrating on something, have a 12 second attention span. Gen Z, eight seconds. You don't have much time to get them. Make sure your website is mobile enabled because they're not interested in a piece of paper that they fill out. They want to be able to use this device for their whole world, right? Makes sense? So snackable content, what I'm talking about there is when I go onto your mobile enabled website and I see join our team and I'm thinking about joining your team and I click on that link, not one thing, not a link to the uh, application, but two things comes down. And one of them is a video. Gen Z consumes six times more video than the written word. Put a video on your website, get with your IT people, and put a video on your website. And what you're going to do when you leave today is you're going to go get your own YouTube channel. Cheap, easy to do. You're going to find your best employee and do a 30 second video of what, hey, saw that you were interested in working here. Here's why this is an awesome place to work. Gen Z, now you, you just engaged with Gen Z, right? You just got a little bit closer and stickier with them. If you've got a, a page on there that's four paragraphs about who you are and where you came from and your grandparents and your dog, Gen Z's not gonna read that. Swipe left, right? You just got ghosted. Snackable content. Easy online application process. People tell me that they have an easy online application process. And so I go and look at it, and I click on it, and a PDF pops up. I have to print the PDF, fill it out with a pen or a pencil, get in my car, and drive to your restaurant to turn it in. That's not easy. That's hard, and Gen Z won't do it. Eight second attention span. So I need to be easy to fill out. I hit submit, and it immediately goes to the restaurant. More, just as significantly as that acknowledgement. What are you hoping for in return when you push something out to social media? Anyone? Likes, thumbs up, all that good stuff. I'm, again, I'm 54, I'm old like you. Look at our gray hair. If, and I don't, I don't push stuff out to social media much at all, my, that's my wife's job. I follow your restaurants, that's what I use social media for. But if I push something out to social media and I don't get any likes, or somebody gives me a thumb down, I don't care, right? I'm 54, I don't care. If I'm 22, I care. I care a lot because I've been on social media since I was a kid and this is how I get gratification from my peers. This is a pat on the back. It's almost like love to this generation. So when I hit, it, I hit submit, I get an auto notice to, sent to, as a text. Hey, we got your application. Thank you very much. Someone's going to be in touch. The smart operator is going to get the same notification pushed to their phone. They're going to, hey, John, thank you for applying. I'm in the middle of my lunch rush. I'll be in touch with you in about two hours. You just gave Gen Z two likes, if you will, in two minutes. You just became more engaged with that applicant. You haven't met them, and you're lowering your turnover. 3,600 bucks at a whack, right? Makes a big difference. This is where they're looking. They look all over the place. Most of us do when we're looking for a job. We're looking all over the place. Look at that bottom one. How's Craigslist doing? 
Some of you are using Craigslist exclusively because they were the first ones on the block. I did the same thing. 15 years ago, it was the coolest thing and it was free back then. Craigslist, according to most people and for sure Gen Z, is where you go to find your murderer. <laughs> Craigslist is not so hot anymore. Start looking in other areas. And the more you look, the bigger that pool gets, okay? And how does Gen Z evaluate opportunities? They're gonna check you out on social media first. They wanna know, because they wanna, Gen Z wants to work at an Instagrammable restaurant. They wanna work at a place that they feel good about pushing photos of food and coworkers out. Is your restaurant Instagrammable? Is it, does it have a good reputation online? Good old fashioned word of mouth is still working, 71%. This on the job training, engaged, is really important still. Glassdoor is another employment site, but go to Glassdoor because when your employees leave you, your younger employees, they leave you, they go to Glassdoor and they write a review on you as an employer. Go find out what you look like on Glassdoor. Super important and a big miss, positive dining experience. You've got 18, 19, 20, 22 year old kids in your restaurant and they like your restaurant. They like the food, they like the people, they think they might wanna work there. So if you're gonna bring them a piece of paper and a golf pencil, that might work for you, because we're old, right? We're used to that. Gen Z doesn't want to fill that out. Put a, put a, put a QR code on the, on the menu, or on point of sale on the tabletop, or on a poster at the front door. So I, and it says, you want to, want to work here? Join our team? Scan this QR code. So you just use your phone, you scan the code, and you immediately get a link to the application, right? Stuff like that we're missing out on. So let's talk about the interview, because it's really important. This is another very heavy-handed and serious video. You don't believe me? <laughs> it's kind of a fun video. We'll watch it for a couple of minutes. However, the takeaway is the little bit more serious part is think about the generation gap that you're going to see in this video. And do you have one at your restaurant? Amy, it says you are trained in technology. That's very good. Are you adept at Excel? No. PowerPoint? No. Publisher? Not really. Exactly in what area of technology mm -hmm. are you proficient? <laughs> Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, Vine, Twitter, you know, the big ones. I'm surprised you didn't say Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's for old people, like my parents. <laughs> That's funny. Well, Amy, when you're working for me, you have to have those kind of research skills because I'll send you things for you to comb through and get the answers and send them to me. So for that, you've got to be really good at technology. For stuff like that, no problem. I'll just ask Siri. You, you'll just ask Siri? You know, Siri tell me this, Siri find me that. We're all good getting you the answers. Tell Siri I want you ready to go at eight sharp each and every morning. I don't understand. What don't you understand? What you just said. You don't understand, be ready to go? No. You said eight, right? Yes. Eight like in the morning, eight? Yes, in the morning. Yeah. That kind of doesn't work for me. Who gets up at eight? I do. I Skype with my French boyfriend in Paris until like three in the morning. I don't even get to Starbucks until like 10 where I order my grande chai tea latte, three pumps, skim milk, light water, 2% foam, extra hot, but not too hot. So if it's okay, I work best in the morning at 10.45. <laughs> wow. Amy, I don't think we're gonna be a good fit. Why are you so negative? I can sense your hostilities and right now I am not feeling very safe. I've been here for over five minutes and the only nice thing you have said to me was nice resume, which I typed all night for this meeting with you. You've given me no guidance, no validation, no encouragement, no supervision. Is there an HR director somewhere? HR director? Yes, I need to speak to someone. I may have to take off today as a mental health day. Take today off you, Amy. Amy, look at me. You don't work here. Are you firing me? Okay, yes. <sighs> <sighs> okay. 
first of all, those are p- two pretty good actors. I think she's great, right? And it's a little bit over the top, but again, I've shown this video before a few times, and I've had people come up to me and say, like, I've interviewed that girl like three times. And I know that in my capacity as president of a, of a company, a restaurant company, on four separate occasions, I remember, four separate occasions, there was a cell phone involved during the interview. Guess how that went? Not so good. <laughs> One time it went okay, because the kid turned beet red and turned his phone back off. But think about that generation gap. None of you are gonna lower or change any of your standards for this generation coming in. Don't change your standards, don't change your restaurant. Just try to engage them where they are, right? So think about that. So the interview, we wanna make sure we put them at ease. Gen Z's not very good at face-to-face, guess why? Gen Z broke up with their girlfriend or boyfriend by texting. Different deal, right? So they're not as accustomed to it. So when we used to sit across the table from somebody 20 years ago and try to intimidate them just a little bit to see how they'd respond, don't do that anymore. Put them at their ease first and you're gonna, and you're gonna figure out who and what they are. Also, given the employment situation we're in, it used to be when you interviewed somebody, you were doing them a favor. The roles have kind of reversed here because we're in a feeding frenzy for good people. You can put together job descriptions with videos on your YouTube channel that you're gonna get, right? Okay. So that way, that way you can tell them this is what I expect from you and this is what you can expect from us. Be prepared to tell them that. This is what you're gonna experience when you come to my awesome restaurant to work. And they're gonna to wanna to know how the job will be stable. This is hangover from the Great Recession. This is how you can succeed at my restaurant and spell it out for them. Then the orientation, which we tend to completely skip, we just go from, you're hired, can you be here tomorrow? Here's your uniform, here's a menu, go memorize it. Don't forget the orientation part. This is one-on-one. Again, 88% don't do a very good job of this. This one-on-one puts, it continues to put them at their ease. We have a tendency to show up for the orientation if we're doing it with a big, thick stack of paper that they have to read every single page, initial each page, and then sign the end, right? That manual, that employee manual tends to say, this is how you can get fired, and this is how you can get fired, and this is how you can get fired. Why don't we start off with our people piece and our culture and our brand first? Let's sit across the table from the new hire and say, this is what we're so good at. This is why you're gonna love working here. Instead of, this is how you get fired. We have to indemnify ourselves and get those things signed, but let's start with people and culture first. And then 20% of new hires will bail out in the first 45 days if they don't get a good orientation. Do a good orientation, I keep saying the same word over and over, it's a strategic engagement with those kids. All your, all your employees really, but especially with Gen Z. Training, let's make sure they have clear expectations. Push to their phone a document, however you wanna do that, that has their calendar laid out with what time they have to be there, who their point of contact is, that's very important. Gen Z wants to know who they're gonna be working with because they've been raised to be scared to death of being embarrassed online. So they're much more comfortable when they know who they're gonna be working with and what they're gonna be responsible for. This is a perfect opportunity for you. Again, I'm gonna point at you again because you're gonna go get this channel going. You need to have a perfect latte every time at your restaurant. Get your best latte maker, three minute video of how to make it. Let Gen Z watch it with the trainer and then you go make it. They learn better that way. You're going to have better productivity. This multiple manager, owner, and touches, I hear a lot from people my age to maybe 45 and a little bit older. God, this generation just needs so much, so many pats on the back. Yeah, they do. You need to manage to that. This is why. They need likes. When I was a kid, coming up through the business, cooking and bartending, If I didn't have an interaction with the manager for eight hours during my shift, I was like, right on. Good for me, I'm doing my job. Today, Gen Z thinks, oh, they don't like me. Swipe left. You just got ghosted, right? Lots of interactions. How you doing? Everything okay? Right, you're doing a great job. That's it, that's all it takes. We just have to engage with these folks more. They're different than we are. Daily debrief, same game. Then we transition them onto the floor, right? It used to be funny back in the day. You needed two servers, you would hire six because there was a million of them looking for work and they only made two thirteen an hour. So you'd hire six. Two wouldn't make it through training. Then you put the other four out there and set them up for failure and see who makes it through. Well, that's crappy. We don't want to do that anymore. 
So we're gonna set them up for success and let them know what success looks like when they're out of training. Again, these multiple check-ins. I'm gonna put, we have, we have a five table section. You're gonna have three tables today and I'm putting you to, in between two veterans and we're gonna keep an eye on you and make sure you're doing well. It just makes them feel more stable, confident and more engaged with you. And of course that debrief, I keep using that one. Continuing education is important. Gen Z and millennials are life learners. Uh, they, they like professional development. They like to be stimulated. They like stuff coming at them. Guess why? This thing. So let's accommodate that. It makes your restaurant better anyway. Experiential. So we get kind of creative. The more cross-training you can do from front to back and back to front, the better off you are. If you can't do that, and I know some of you cannot, we'll talk about solutions for it. Partner up with suppliers. Liquor, beer, wine, coffee beef, whatever it is that you specialize in, can, there's these bigger companies that distribute, they have educational opportunities that they pay for. They can come in for 20 minutes and teach your staff about why your prime rib is better than everyone, anyone else's, front of the house and back of the house. Take advantage of that. Holy crap, look at all those words. We're not going to talk about all of those either. This cre was created because I'm out in the restaurant world and I'm asking people over and over, besides competitive wages, what are you doing to keep your people? Well, we have competitive wages. Of course you do, you have no choice. We're in a situation right now from a, a staffing standpoint that we have to have competitive wages. So besides competitive wages, what are you doing? A lot of people tell me, well, we offer insurance and we have a big holiday party. What percentage of your employees take the insurance? Nationally, it's less than 10%. 90% of the other people are not engaged with you. I ask people in restaurants that work at restaurants, what do you think about the holiday party? Eh, it's fine. We go out every night anyway. What'd you spend on your last holiday party? Two grand, three grand, four grand? Can you divide that up? I got a restaurant that I was working with up in the mountains. No one showed up to the holiday party and the owner was pissed. So well, what happened? He said, well, a bunch of them told me they didn't have, they didn't have enough gas to get down to the restaurant. Take the money and go buy 100 gas cards and give them to your staff. You're now more engaged. There's a million things you can do for little or no money to engage with your staff and encourage them to stay with you because they feel like you're part of who they, they want to be in their success and you're sticky with them. The first two I'm proud of because they're mine. That's what I did at my restaurants. My, the, in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, most of my guys in the back of the house spoke English as a second language if they spoke English at all. My Spanish is just barely okay. And it was so frustrating for me because there was wonderful people that worked for me for years and I never could engage with them as much as I wanted to because of that language barrier. So finally, duh, I went out to the community college, I found a Spanish teacher, we worked out a trade and she came in every Saturday and did an hour of teaching my, Sp uh, my Spanish speakers English and vice versa. The best part was watching people learn another language, try to communicate with each other because we sucked at it, right? Our, our grammar was terrible and everybody laughed. And so we started breaking that imaginary wall between the back of the house and the front of the house. You know what I'm talking about? Started breaking that down. I also figured out there was a lot of guys that were working for me that were spending way too much money to send money home to another country. So we got a guy to come in and teach him how to sign up at a bank and how a debit card works and all that stuff. There's a million things you can do to engage with your employees. Got to build that bench, we've got to be looking for our all-stars, right? So the career path is important. Generation Z, the oldest of which is 23, has been looking at millennials for a while and they see $1.5 trillion in student debt that millennials are carrying. Gen Z is like, hmm, not sure if I'm interested in that. I like working in restaurants. You guys are adding restaurants and you're getting busier. Can I grow with you? Can I create a career with you? Make it easy for them, right? Have a path, have a map. Consistent feedback. And I'll tell you the story again, when I was pushing hard to get into management when I was much, much younger, I'd come into my day off and work in the kitchen so I could learn saute. Well, that's stupid. But I wanted it that bad. So I kept going to my GMs and say, hey, what else, what else can I do? I want to move up. And I got the same answer almost every time. Just keep doing what you're doing. That's a crappy answer. A good answer is, cross train into the kitchen, become a shift supervisor, become a shift leader, da 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 Give them, lay that path out for them. They're more likely to stay with you. Last thing we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna go over by a couple of minutes. 
culture. It's a huge piece. Culture can be defined as how your employees experience your restaurant. That's the culture. So we talk, to, we talk about in the restaurant business, if we have a brand in place, and if you don't, you need, a brand is basically, we will always, we will never. And all the employees know the answers to those two comments. You model the way. You're the one out front saying, we will always, we will never, and you show that every day that you're at work. Old school, praise in public, criticize in private. It's not 1992, right? We can't be the red-faced, cursing, screaming chef, throwing plates. There's too many restaurants that are hiring, and they all pay about the same. So why would I work for you? Because you have an awesome culture and you don't throw plates. Be consistent and fair. I mean, this is just, you guys know, this is, you already know what I'm telling you right here. Celebrate those wins. Collaboration and community. The U.S. is 20... Make sure I get this right. 36% non-Caucasian. Gen Z is 48% non-Caucasian. They're already in a, in a more comprehensive melting pot than the previous generations. That's collaboration and community. How are you serving that in your restaurant? Coach, teach, and motivate. At the end of the day, that's what we do. We think we're restaurant operators, but we're, we coach, we teach, we're psychologists, sometimes we're police officers, all that stuff that we do. So finally, on this engagement piece, Successful operators that have low turnover, 3,600 bucks, 3,600 bucks, 3,600 bucks, super engaged, they, and they do that by listening actively. We've always been engaged with our external customers in the dining room, at the table, spending money. We have to be just as engaged with our internal customers, our hourly employees. They know what's going on with these folks as individuals. When we train a new manager to be a floor manager, we teach them not to look at a full dining room as a herd of people, right? We teach them to look at them as individuals with individual wants and needs that paid you the compliment of coming into your restaurant. Same game with your staff. So let me leave you with this, and then if you have any questions, we can, we can do that. Your customers, listen to this part. Your customers' experience will never outperform your employee's experience. Let me say that again because it's really important. Your customer's experience in your restaurant will never outperform your employee's experience in your restaurant. If you're cussing and being mean and being stubborn, you're going to drive your staff down. And guess who goes down with them? Your, your customers. Fewer customer visits, less money being spent. Engage with your staff. Know what their wants and needs are. Keep your standards high. I'm not saying lower your standards. Keep your standards high. They'll, they'll come up to them. Raise your staff up through engagement, proper onboarding, and culture, and they're going to raise your customers up too. And when your customers get raised up, your check average, your top line gets better, and your turnover goes down, and your bottom line gets better. Your quality of life gets better. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>